Well, good afternoon, um, depending on your time zone. And I would like to welcome you to Talent War Group podcast number 27. Um, I'm going to start off by saying, why is it called People First? Uh, people First. I wrote it down. Where did I put it? People First. Winning matters. There you right? go. There, there we you go. go. Okay. Nailed it. And, and I want to make sure I, I say this right, because I had the pleasure recently as an Army Reserve Battalion Commander to go to the pre-command course. And, and I actually got to hear why General McConnell said, people first, winning matters. And, you know, in the military, it is incredibly important that we win. There's no second place. There's no ribbon. There, there's nothing on, on the far side. And sometimes we forget about that because the day-to-day -day of the military is not, is not war fighting necessarily, but it is taking care of people. And your day-to-day -day activities in the military is making sure that those people are medically ready, combat ready, tactically and technically proficient. There's a whole laundry list that goes into winning. And all of those things can be covered by the umbrella of people first. And, and I really enjoy that message because um, it is in complete alignment with my non-reserve uh, duties, which is working with the talent war group. So I'm going to quick introduce everybody who's on the screen right now, just for anybody who's listening. Um, I'm going to start with our guest of honor, which is retired Colonel Michael Arnold. He is the deputy director of the Army Talent Management Task Force um, and a, a very interesting person with a great, uh, a great job right now. And because I'm going to let him talk as soon as I'm done, I'm not going to give too many more details. Um, the other person here is uh, Mr. Mike Sorelli, who is one of the authors of The Talent War. And I'm going to do a completely shameless plug right now. If you haven't bought it yet, you are behind the power curve. And what I like about this is not only does it tie directly into the discussions we're having today, but it's something that I've used a couple of these uh, tools and techniques and references in my non-work life because people matter in your house as well. And there are things with regards to talent management that work with sports teams and athletics, et cetera. So back to the, uh, the topic at hand, um, I wanna point out, or I wanna emphasize the, why am I talking to Michael Arnold and Mike Sorelli? And that's because the army is, it's a bureaucracy. It's one of the biggest, oldest institutions that we have. And I know that word sounds like a negative thing, but it's also been a really positive thing. How many things have occurred? How many changes in culture have occurred because they started with our military? And if the military is slow to move and can make changes, then why can't the rest of us? When we're talking about talent management, if the army who's been doing it since their inception in 1775, if the army continues to work on talent management so much that they create a task force with America's best and brightest, active duty and retired. I'm friends with a couple people on the task force, so I definitely know that they're best and brightest. Um, if the Army's willing to put that much time and energy into it, then those of us in corporate America should also see the importance of that people first mentality. And my personal story, the reason why this one is very near and dear to my heart is after graduating from West Point in 2000, I was in love with the Army. I was going to either die or get kicked out. And that is exactly what I told everyone who met me. And nobody thought I would ever get out. Seven years after active service, I bailed. And not, not lightly. I kind of bitter bailed where mm. I walked away. I didn't join the reserve. I didn't contact a local unit. I said thank you so long, <laughs> and I was done. And then something interesting happened. My husband joined the reserve. Now he's a Marine and I'm, I'm Army, and that was actually one of the reasons that we decided to get off active duty. He joined the reserve and was having such a good time. And he talked about the fraternity and he talked about the gun club and he talked about his boys. And, and I started having these flashbacks of 
hey, bring your kids, bring your friends. Doesn't matter if it's two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. Let's get together and play beach volleyball because so and so had a bad breakup or so and so's dad died. So let's all get together and do something. Pick up basketball. It's the military was this this constant tribe and and I missed that. So I joined back up, but just part time because there was a lot of parts of the military, full time military service that that can be difficult. It's it's a challenge. So um, that's the brief version of my story. And I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of discussion here. So I want to keep I want to keep my monologue a little bit abbreviated. And I also want to point out that whether you're listening on LinkedIn or Facebook or any of the other broadcasting mechanisms, please use the comments to type in any questions you have, because if not, I've got a page and a half of questions for Michael here, and I will keep them busy on things I want to know. So um, I want to transition and let Michael Arnold uh, take the floor and talk about his task force with regards to the Army Talent Management System. Well, thanks, Lisa, and, and thanks, Lisa, to you and and Mike for the opportunity to join the Talent War Group, and uh, and the and those that are viewing today to discuss talent. Um, talent management is something I've been doing for the Army about two and a half years now, uh, and the moniker uh, "People First, Winning Matters" is isn't just empty. It's a reflection of how important modernizing talent is uh, in a free and open society in, in today's security environment, and something. Uh, our Army senior leaders take very important, both uh, our political appointees uh, and our senior uh, uh, general officers, and particularly our chief staff of the Army. It really is an attempt um, to look at the historic Amer American strategic adv advantages and where we are at a point in time. I think you alluded to this just a minute ago, Lisa, is, you know, the Army is uh, in existence to, to fight and win America's war if we're called to do so. Um, but we've seen some erosion of some advantages we've had. The economy, we're no longer guaranteed to have the most powerful economy. Technology, our competitors are closing the gap. And the population, our adversaries um, could have larger and more rapidly growing populations. So what advantage do we have? People. And uh, it is going from uh, an industrial size uh, style personnel management system um, where it's kind of a one size uh, plug and play uh, two-dimensional. I think you may, in your experience, Lisa, um, have kind of viewed it that way. You were an engineer officer and you are a lieutenant colonel. And oftentimes we felt like any engineer or any lieutenant colonel could be plugged in and played uh, when one goes away and does something else, which is far from the truth when you, when you employ um, data-driven elements but even more importantly, when you want to go to a 21st century um, talent management system. And so that's what the, the senior leaders in the Army tasked us uh, on the task force to do, is to look at ways that we could not just make a 10% change uh, in our Army's personnel management system, but to do a 10x change, to go look at the public sector, to look at the private sector, to figure out best practices and see how we could evolve from an industrial size system um, to more of an information and data-driven system that employs talent management. Now, I talked about the two dimensions and what talent management does for us today is provides us a multi-dimensional look at the individual. As we look at four pillars of how we manage people, we employ them, we develop them, we acquire them, and re we retain them. Um, but we want to look at much more than just a branch and a pay grade. We want to look at things like their knowledge, their skills, their behaviors, and their preferences. And if you want to break those down, really a knowledge is what do I know? A skill is what can I do? A behavior is how can I act? And, and, uh, and when you think of a preference, it's what are my career goals? And so taking all of those into account with a couple of initiatives, and I think I can probably cover those as we continue our dialogue and answer specific questions is what we've done for two and a half years uh, based off of some authorities that Congress gave us back in 2019 in the National Defense Authorization Act. We moved from a system uh, kind of outlined by the Defense Officer Management Personnel Act, DOTMA, which was around uh, about in the early 80s, which essentially is the upper out system that we have known for quite a while in the military. The upper out system really was used in World War II. 
Uh, and Congress gave each of uh, the, the services in the Department of Defense the opportunity to loosen some of those laws and rules uh, to create more flexible career paths for people. Um, and so we have embarked on a mission um, to, uh, to incorporate um, some new initiatives uh, in how we manage people. So I think that's kind of a, a good summary of where we are uh, in terms of what we've done. There's a ton of specifics I could go into with all that, but I think that's a great kind of opening uh, segment. Uh, and I, I stand by for any other comments or questions. Well, I will jump in here. First off, um, <clears throat> Michael, I'm, I'm going to politely correct you. Uh, you said you've been in talent management for the last two years. How long have you been serving? Well, you're absolutely right. I know where you're going with this. So 25 years of active duty service in the Army and then doing my, my duties as the deputy director for about two and a half years. Your, your point is uh, leadership and talent management are always incorporated uh, in, in our business. Um, and I think that's good to correct me on that. So thanks, Mike. The, it, yes, because uh, I, I remember, you know, as a, a, as a young 03, 04, always trying to help our, our young enlisted or, or junior officers identify their weaknesses, their strengths, how they, you know, what steps they needed to, uh, to take to accelerate within, uh, within the organization. This is what I find uh, amazing is that, and again, uh, you know, we, we, we talked before we go live here. Uh, yeah, Navy uh, is about to say that the Army is, is the preeminent leadership development platform in the world. It is. And an organization that's been doing this for, I mean, the, the Army is 245 years old, but two years ago, the fact that they produce more leaders probably per capita than any other organization out there. And you guys said, we're, we're not good with just the status quo. Let's get better at this. Mm -hmm. And uh, watching the performance of the Army and every other service on the battlefield during the global war on terror, um, I, I, I don't know how you get much better. So the, the fact that you guys have engaged in this, what I think this translates is there's a lot of business leaders out there who've gone to business school. Maybe they didn't, got their undergrad, uh, or maybe they went to an MBA program. Talent management is not a subject that is taught in any business school. If it is, it's not taught well. For these young business leaders or, or immature uh, business leaders in terms of the life cycle of their business, what are some of the best practices that you guys learned and implemented it into the army based off all the research and looking at how different organizations manage their talent. Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And I think to just to start off broad and then maybe give you some specific examples is um, we're differentiating talent. So, so we are recognizing that the, those that serve in uniform, regardless of what branch or specialty they may have, regardless of what rank they may be, officer, non-commissioned officer, junior enlisted, um, there's an inherent set of knowledges, skills, and behaviors that differentiate them even further than just to, to the two dimensions I talked about before. So first of all, recognizing that and then becoming more data rich about how we view that. So in things like, and I'll give you an example, our, uh, our regulated marketplace, which we call the Army Talent Alignment Process, we now have a resume that individual officers put together. And uh, not only do they have a short description of the things that, they're, that they kind of classify as, as their knowledge, their skills, and their behaviors, there's a group of those KSBs, as we call them, that they talk about in that, uh, in, in that uh, uh, resume. And, and right now, it's kind of nested in a system, in a system that HRC runs. Um, that allows uh, individual commanders with vacated with uh, you know positions that are uh, that are that are vacated in an annual uh, assignment cycle, if you will, to to look and dive into individual KSBs for the types of people they may want to hire into a position. So it's not necessarily the way we used to do it. Is our Army's Human Resources Command uh, and assignment officers would fulfill that responsibility and. And wherever that um, shortage was for, for, for Army readiness, we would fill it with really a two-dimensional look. Um, and so now we've got the uh, ability to look more deeply into a person. And you may want somebody, if your unit is deploying to a particular area, to have additional skills that aren't necessarily found in any other Army record. So if you want somebody who speaks a foreign language, somebody who may have uh, experience if we're expanding out from the active component into potentially 
the, the National Guard or the Reserves, maybe somebody has a career in a civilian industry that you're looking to capitalize on. And so you may want to use that opportunity to pull more details into who you select for the assignment. So really, um, it, it's mo it's moving. Um, and, and, and again, Lisa alluded to this, that the, you know, the Army is a large bureaucracy. We're talking about uh, 90,000 active component um, officers um, just as one of the three components. And then when you think about um, the annual cycle, in the last two years, we have moved 30,000 people uh, using this new system. And so now we've really kind of taken the middle piece out, allowed the, the commanders at the brigade level to select who they want to bring into their teams. They now have the ability to build their team. It was just kind of an automatic fill previously. Their shortages would be filled by the HRC. Um, and then the individual officer can go look for the types of locations um, and the types of jobs they want that match those KSBs. Um, so that's just one example, I think, of how we're moving to a data-rich kind of scenario, looking at more uh, granular level information about the individual where they can be placed in the right job at the right time over time. And, and again, what comes with that, ironically, is people are more empowered about their own career choices and they're more satisfied in what they're doing. Hey, I get to say, I get to say, it's not the army tells me I have to go to X, Y, or Z. I get to compete. I get to go into this regulated marketplace. I get to look at the units that interest me, interview, exchange uh, uh, information with the unit and the unit with me. And I think that makes a, a much better system, a much more data rich system and when we're looking at the security environment that we're operating in, uh, a greater ability for us to put the right person in the right job. So Michael, I actually wanna develop on this a little bit, um, specifically with regards to what I call the happiness equation. Um, I have shifted from the military where uh, the happiness equation is almost dictated for you. And depending on whether or not your boss is a good boss decides everything to what you're talking about. So I, I, I wanna peel that onion a bit. And then corporate America, where this happy equation in my mind has three sides. You have, um, how much money do you make? Uh, where are you located? And job satisfaction. And part of that job satisfaction, of course, includes the people you work for and with. But um, in the army, the, the pay scale is already banded and dictated. So you can't pay somebody more you, we in the military bonus for reenlistments, but as an officer, I never got a magic paycheck, a magic additional paycheck with regards to, to funding. Um, talking about location, you can list your favorite locations, but I put Korea somewhere on my list at some point in time and ended up there for two years. So you don't necessarily, and actually it was one of my, my favorite experiences. All that being said, it wasn't necessarily my number one or my number two. And then you talk about job satisfaction. And this is a huge item in corporate America. And I love that the military is, is adapting it. And, and we do it actually in the reserve. I do it for um, my civilians who work for me, my, my DA civilians, but I also do it with uh, some of my AGR, sometimes some of my, my full-time military staff. And I have an opportunity to interview. And I'm glad to see that the active component is looking at this but um, I kind of want to uh, explore a little bit more as a battalion commander, what does that look like? And, and let Mike talk about the, the crossovers into corporate America with regards to, I mean, this is a huge topic in the book with regards to the hiring process. And, and for anybody listening, one of the points I want to make is the interview is not just for the supervisor. The interview is also critical for you as the individual, because if you're missing any of those pillars on the happiness equation or any of those sides in the happiness equation, you're going to do like I did and, and you're going to check out and then and then maybe regret it a little bit later. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Michael, first to see if you can kind of expand a little bit, um, specifically because a lot of our audience is corporate America to right. see what the uh, similarities might be. Well, we, we came to some realization that there were for sure uh, some generational and cultural norms shifting uh, in, the, in the working population. Things like uh, dual income families uh, being, you know, the, the predominant kind of uh, employee. And this includes um, folks that are serving in the military. Uh, 
job flexibility is one that we see our our gener our younger generations um, and there's a natural fit because there's so many different things you can you can do in the army b beyond just whatever branch you end up selecting at your commissioning source. Um, but we 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 clearly saw in in lots of feedback that the weight of preference was really important. I think this is what equates to your happiness equation, as as you call it, Lisa. But we we knew we had to manage that talent, or we had the potential to lose it. And I think that goes along with some of the other things in the talent war book. Um, we we recognized as we uh, talked with folks from the public and private uh, sector. That there's a war for talent. We we I can rec I can recall going out to Silicon Valley talking with the folk good folks at Google. They recognize this, and so so when you think about the the shifts in generational culture norms, and you apply those uh, along with some information technology that's now available. Again, I think um, you talked about pay, um, and then and then I think the other piece you mentioned was location. And then the third is your your happiness in the job. So you know there are there are finite locations that we can assign you to. Um, you 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 could potentially go to Fort Polk, Louisiana, or you could go to you know Fort Shafter in Hawaii or Fort Carson. And certainly there are locations just based on the location themselves that are much more coveted than other locations. But we found that when you enter into a marketplace and you have more information that the location becomes one of many things. It just was the natural default mode because nobody had any other option, like what kind of commander am I gonna be working for? What is the role and mission of the organization? How quickly can I get on the list to a key developmental assignment? Is it longer at one location versus somewhere else? And so when people have that exchange of information, it's much more rich. They feel like they're empowered to make decisions and, and even if they don't get their top choice, um, they, they may find that, hey, well, I had a say, I could rank order the things that are important to me, and, it, and I'm, I'm a part of the process. It's not something that happens in the back of a closed door in a secret room where my future is you know, designed by somebody who may be throwing a dart or some process that I don't know nothing about. So I think, Lisa, that gets to your question. And I think that's, so we're two cycles into this. Now, COVID created a little bit of a hiccup for us because uh, all of DOD had this stop move that went into place. So we had a, 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 an assignment cycle last summer. We took a little bit of a pause. We normally do two a year for the winter cycle, which is a smaller cycle for the Army as we rotate folks into new positions. So we basically didn't do anything. And then we increased this more recent uh, cycle for this summer's moves. So all in all, I think I mentioned we've moved 30,000 people officers um, uh, in, in this new market style approach. Um, and we were seeing much more satisfaction um, on the individual officers having preference ability to say where I want to go. Now they may get their top choice or maybe their top two or three. And then we're also finding from the commanders. Now this is, this is another point I want to make is, is there's much more satisfaction, but it's not, it's not an automatic or easy button to do it. It requires additional work. You've got to focus your staff. You've got to invest energy and time and people to make you make the, the you know the kind of preference on your on the incoming side. So the supply and demand of the market, I guess, if you will. Um, and so we're working through some of that. And I think the, the goal of our Army senior leaders was to move out on this because there's a cultural aspect that needs to change. We recognize that we're going to catch up with the IT. We've got a couple of things uh, that are all underway. The integrated personnel and pay system for the Army, IPSA, is being developed, which is a which is a much better piece of technology that allows us to do all those functions for all components in one system rather than multiple systems. Um, but we knew uh, when we embarked on this mission that it wasn't perfect, and that you know people would have some challenges working with somewhat of a of a of a uh, an older platform in terms of technology we have made iterative changes and it's gone continuously better but the the goal was to kind of change this cultural mindset of individuals having the ability to preference and having a say in their assignment process and then commanders at the 06 or colonel level um, having the ability to build their teams 
That is absolutely amazing because I'm thinking back to the, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, 1999 to, to 2006 where you were told, uh, especially as a junior officer, this is where you're going. This is your choices. And right. sometimes they were, it, they were two awful choices. Um, Lisa, it, it's interesting you brought up money. And now money, based off, you know, life changes, has become a higher priority for me now that we're in, uh, uh, you know, a truly free enterprise uh, environment as a civilian again. I, I found that during my military career, the money was not, it wasn't even in the top three. It was satisfaction and purpose behind what I was doing. Uh, Michael, you know, what, what's the feedback you're getting from, from soldiers? Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be overwhelmingly positive. The fact that, and you've said it, they feel like they have autonomy over their careers. And there's a lot of that applies to the, the private sector because that's what leads to a lot of uh, employee disengagement. When you have dis, uh, disengaged employees, you've actually created a money pit, uh, which can sink companies. Yeah. So the, so the initial feedback, we, we never promised perfection in the first iteration, but steady improvement. And again, the, the, the mantra not to make a 10 percent change, but to completely change um, in a 10x fashion the way we manage people. Um, so, so lots of positive comments. Um, and, and in fairness, we started with our officer cohort. Um, it really is the smallest uh, of the overall population. So we are moving in a direction now to integrate some of these changes um, into our senior non-commissioned officer and enlisted forces. So a, an effort with the Sergeant Major of the Army to adopt some of what we're doing for our officers, for our non-commissioned officers and enlisted workforce. The other thing that I think is creating uh, a, a lot of positive energy is, is we, we no longer, um, as we look at promotions um, and the, the way that the system used to work was a, a board file would meet um, and a score would be given to you based off of what your senior rater provided on your evaluation, your annual evaluation. And so what we quickly came to realize, and again, this wasn't just in the two and a half years that I've been doing this, but a, a ton of research has been done in a number of years, but we were now able to put some of this in practice. And this, this is this culture of assessments and using cognitive and non-cognitive assessments along with evaluations um, to, to evaluate um, promotion and senior leader positions. Um, and really, when you think about an, an evaluation, it really is a subjective piece of information from uh, your boss. Uh, and so when you when you look at how we selected people for promotions and assignments and, and, and the privilege of commanding battalion and brigades, for example, um, you, you know, it was really kind of a one sided and narrow view of what that person could contribute. Um, and now. We, we still use evaluations. Of course, evaluations are important. Um, but in, in addition to those evaluations, we use um, a series of assessments throughout an officer's career. Um, at the beginning of an officer's career, um, it's more developmental uh, and, and then a little, a little bit of diag diagnostic. But then we want to put some predictive uh, pieces of those assessments in place, again, to find the right fit, the right leader to lead um, our soldiers in formations like battalions and brigades. So one of the other things um, that a, a lot of our um, a, a lot of our force is talking about is our commander's assessment program. We've hosted um, two battalion commanders assessment programs uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, one colonel's command assessment program. We've piloted a sergeant major's assessment program, a first sergeant assessment program, and then because I think enough people are starting to figure out you know, that we're using this combination um, of more information to figure out who is who are the right leaders. And I think this gets into some of what you allude to in your book, Mike, on the special operations community. And so we're looking a little bit more deeper at, at the person uh, in this assessment process and um, a lot of positive energy, uh, so much so that, you know, our acquisition leaders um, have asked, hey, can we participate this in this? Um, the chief of the Army chaplain said, hey, I'd like to use something similar to this to assign my division level chaplains. And so, again, a much more granular level uh, of information, the data, helping people make informed decisions about who we select for promotion 
and who we assign to positions of responsibility as commander. I think a, a, a lot of positive energy, and we're we're really, um, uh, you know, the, the the scale that we the we prototype piloted it. Uh, implemented and scaled this and then kind of did this throughout the army was, was pretty uh, aggressive. Uh, but again, I think that is due to the, the alignment we've got from our army senior leaders that we've got to do something different than this old industrial style process uh, to select the very best because our army needs it, our nation needs it, and it's going to pay us big dividends uh, you know, if we have to fight and win the next war. Michael, I'm <clears throat> I'm actually getting fired up listening to this. This this is absolutely amazing. When, and when you know senior leaders in the army are talking about making sure that they have the right people in the right positions, I mean that's that's just encouraging that the army is going to be around for another 245 years. Yeah. Um, now, it, it, the the assessments you're holding at the senior levels, um, mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of business sectors do that, and I would put that into the sort of the bucket of succession planning and stacking and ranking your top leaders and who's going to continue within the, uh, the organization. As you're talking about, um, and, and this just didn't exist, not even in, in the SEAL teams, which is a, a, you know, is dwarfed in size by the entire army, is commanders didn't have the, the ability to choose their own teams. I'm thinking back to the story of uh, Colonel David Hackworth. And for our listeners, Colonel David Hackworth is one of the most decorated soldiers uh, in the history of the army. And when he was tasked with taking over the 439th, which at the time was known as the hard luck because they were the most uh, undisciplined uh, combat unit in Vietnam who had taken the most casualties, he was allowed to select his sergeant major, his company commanders, his operations officer to make sure that he assembled a cast of leaders he knew would perform. And sub 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 subsequently, they turned around that, uh, that battalion into the most combat effective uh, battalion. Um, I, I've got to assume that the performers, the high performers that every rank in the army are actually excited about this system because it sounds like you are, you know, and I don't want to be derogatory towards the military. You know, sometimes, it, you know, you were on a linear path. If you didn't like do something uh, outrageous, you would go into the next level. It sounds like the army is now putting a precedence on performance. So, so performance, um, as one aspect of it, but these assessment too, which is another way to get objective information, not subjective. You know, you could argue that performance and the way you do your duties and the way you're evaluated or rated to do those um, is, is somewhat objective, depending on who is providing you with that rating. Um, and so if you incorporate other things, um, and I, I just run through psychometric assessments or cognitive and non-cognitive assessment, looking at things like written communication, strategic attributes. Of course, because we're the, the army, there will be a physical fitness aspect to this. And then an operational psychological interview. So, so and, and then really the kicker is when we're doing at the battalion and brigade level, this the, the commander's assessment program, it's a double blind panel. We don't look at any performance data. Now it counts in the way that the OML is calculated, but there's a, there's a curtain and nobody gets to see any uniform, any bells and whistles. It really is an interview. And at the end of that interview, uh, with all of these different aspects um, applied, um, we, we create a, an order of merit list uh, to select the very best to lead our battalion and brigade organizations. And I think that is exciting. And again, I think very similar to the assignment process, the feedback we're getting from many leaders is, hey, I have a stake in my own professional development. Um, I get to go in and it's my responsibility to, to write effectively, to communicate verbally in an effective manner, to do those things um, that are beyond just performance and what are in my file. And people like that. People like the opportunity that they have a hand in, in the way that they're selected. Now, the other, the beauty of this is if you, the way we've, um, it kind of worked this, um, is that you're, you're found ready for command or not yet ready for command. And it's not derogatory. So if you are not ready for command, it doesn't go, uh, any, uh, anywhere on your record. It's, it's just, uh, you'll get to the opportunity to compete again. And then, um, we found the importance of coaching. So I think some of the other things that we're doing is providing, um, 
you know, because there is a difference, I think, with professional development from your boss, from your, from lead, lead from a leader, um, mentorship, which really is inherently voluntary between the mentor and the mentee, uh, but then a, a confidential opportunity to to look at assessment information, and then to have a private conversation with a, a certified career coach. Uh, so that you as an individual can figure out where your blind spots are or where, you know, where some of your strengths and your shortcomings are, and then you're able to fix those. And, and none of that occurs with anybody you don't want it to. Uh, and so the Army senior leaders have found that that's an important aspect um, of giving feedback to our leaders that are participating in some of these programs. Um, so, I, so I think that really sums up, uh, I, I think, where you're going, Mike. Um, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, kind of close with, with that one for right now. And we can move on to, I know Lisa looks like she's ready to ask me something else. You know, Michael, I wrote down three or four questions that I had just, just off that discussion. But of course, as I promised, if people ask questions in the comments, I'm going to let them go first. Sure. Uh, and this is actually from a friend of mine, a Marine. And I realized as I was reading the comment that I've never said his last name out loud. So I apologize, Dennis, if I say it wrong. Dennis Clyde Jr., um, this is what he's asking. Do you think that with the ability to pick your team, it causes less exposure to leadership challenges associated with involuntary mandatory movement? If so, does that potentially hinder leadership development by reducing exposure to that personnel that is challenging to deal with because they can handpick their next duty station? Great question, Dennis. I'm throwing it to you, Michael. Yeah, so that's, that is a fantastic question. And I would, I would only respond by saying there's always a system of checks and balances. So when I say that commanders get the ability to select and build their teams, it's not willy nilly, you get whatever you want because it's a marketplace. So you have to also compete for that talent that you're bringing into your organization. And the analogy is, is the way we used to do, and when you had a high performer, what, what could happen is you would say, hey, I want to get to unit A. Can you do a by name request? So we would, we would create this black market of workarounds where somebody would put a by name request, say, hey, I really want Lisa to come to my organization, assign her there. And so what this regulated marketplace does is it takes that black market approach and puts it in the light of day. Everything is transparent and every decision you make and why you made it, both as, a, as an, a, an officer, individual officer competing for that assignment or as a commander working with your team to select your preferences for who you want to come on your team is all transparent. And so I think that diminishes the concern, Dennis, that you were, you were alluding to. It doesn't you know, of course, th th there is a sense of accountability, and and you we also uh, se seem to get questions about, well, hey, what if you pick all left-handed, blue-eyed people? Well, no, you can't do that either because we're holding people accountable for the, the for that that element of diversity, and uh, and and again, what's unique and what we're seeing because we're only a couple of years into this, two cycles is we're, we're seeing less of an impact on diversity issues because you have more data to make a decision. You've got more information about an individual. Where did they study? What degree do they have? Do they speak any foreign languages? Did they have a job somewhere else? And so you're like, I've never seen that much information. And, and so commanders now have a much greater ability to look at that granular level of information and make decisions. And again, it, it's, it's a market. So there's a supply and a demand. So you've got to kind of have that talk with the individual and say, hey, I'd really like to hire you and I'll put you at the top of my list. Where do I fit on your list? And it's forcing those discussions, which are giving people a stake in their own assignment process, which I think is beautiful. Uh, and I think only benefits the individual. It benefits the unit in terms of uh, you know parameters like readiness. And it really benefits the institution because, again, when you when you think of readiness, what we typically do is we think of short term readiness. So the filling a position that's vacant so that we're ready to deploy. But you also have to think of readiness in a long term approach, which is really how do we retain people to stay beyond just the next assignment? And if there's a lot of that happiness factor, Lisa, that you're talking about satisfaction in getting the job and going where you kind of have a say where you're going people are more likely to stay in and kind of serve longer. So I think 
I hope that answers the question a little bit, uh, Dennis, but uh, if not, please hit me up and I'll clarify anything else that I may not have covered. Now, Michael, you brushed over something that I, of course, is near and dear to my heart, and that's the diversity topic. And of course, we've had uh, talent war group discussions about it in the past, and we will in the future. But I want to point out a great example. Um, my husband's currently in an 06 command in the reserve, and he is six foot nine, white male, shaved head, not bald, shaved head. It's by choice. Um, I am told I have to emphasize that anytime I describe him. <laughs> and his his executive officer is a five foot two Hispanic female. And he was briefing his soldiers and they actually had some diversity training. And he said, the two of us are by far the least diverse team you have ever met, but we're the most diverse team you've ever seen. So I love the fact that it's a data poll and it's a discussion. And, you know, my personal moniker is delete the adjective. And, you know, what I look like or how I speak doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be the best person for the job or create the best command team because of that cognitive diversity. So understanding that we could spend another hour and a half just on that sure. discussion point and you, you you brushed over it very casually. I did want to emphasize that that's a part of the program that I really love. But to stay true to what I said I was going to do, I want to <laughs> um, read a question from Mr. David H. Horner Jr. We've got a lot of juniors today. Um, he asks, can you talk a bit about the challenges associated with homesteading at one duty location, i.e. Fort Bragg wanting to stay there, or in, back in my day, you did Fort Bragg, Korea, so you could come back to Fort Bragg, um, and commanders there wanting to select him or her. How are you approaching this through the assignment process, and how do assignment algorithms account for repeated assignments at a, t at a particular location? Yeah, so that's that. That also is a fantastic question because I mean, in the culture of the army, it was always an unwritten rule that that you don't homestead somewhere. So it differentiates your career. And so every two, three, four years, whatever, where whenever you come up on the assignment cycle, it would be just a natural. Hey, I gotta I gotta pick up, pull pitch, move, and find a different location. And so there's as we look at this in in a in a 21st century talent management based system. Uh, we, we think of it slightly different and, and I'm not going to call it homesteading, but there is more of an opportunity now for people to remain as long as they can differentiate those career, op those career experiences at the same location. And uh, I think there's data that also shows that it's in the institution, in the units and in the individual's best interest sometimes for those opportunities to exist. So it's not a, an unwritten rule that you must move every couple of years. In fact, um, there are many positive attributes to keeping somebody at one location. Again, when you think of the demographics and, and other things that are important to our generational cohorts, say you're married to a professional spouse who's not a service member and they've got a great job. So it's in the Army's best interest to find another location for you within that installation and employ you, allow you to, to contribute your talents maybe in a unit in a trade doc organization training and doctrine, and then moving to a forces command, a ta more tactical unit um, and differentiating something out. Now there are more places that leads is, you know, are more conducive to type to, to those types of differentiated assignments staying at the same place. Um, and so I, th I would shy away from the, the term homesteading um, because it's got such a negative con connotation and I, I would just say again, based off this granular level of information, having more than just a two-dimensional look at the individual officer, um, based off of family conditions or other desires, we're we're now more open to looking at opportunities to keep some people, if if the conditions merit, um, on the same installation for a few for a few terms. And there's nothing wrong with that. Thanks for that answer, Michael. That's really good um, and very interesting because I know that was an issue and a concern. And and oddly enough, it transfers directly to some of the corporate jobs as well. Um, when I worked for Shell Oil Company, it's very similar to the military in that it's huge and it's global. And there is there has been previously a very direct accession path. 
take this job, then take this job. If you're willing to move, you'll probably get promoted faster. You'll have a better review at the end of the year. And, and so it was always a struggle for me once my kids started school. Hey, am I giving up the opportunity to promote because I don't want to move? So I, I love that discussion point and I really appreciate um, that question being asked. I want to ask one more question, then we're going to go through a round robin. Um, for anybody whose question wasn't read, I just want to say I'm going to look back through these questions and get with Michael to see if if we can answer these questions for you, because I know I have a bunch and um, I'm sure I, and I see that there are a lot more out there that aren't just technical pulling from what the task force is doing, but conceptual. And like I said in the intro, if the army is doing this right um, and then the army is putting this much effort, we can definitely pull for the, from your knowledge in corporate America. So the next and the last uh, listener question I want to ask is from Jonathan Vill Villari. And I apologize if I say it wrong. It's, I wonder if the Army's talent development will impact how civilian hiring managers value veteran potential. And, and this one is near and dear to my heart as well. And I'm actually going to start by sending this over to Mike Sorelli because he lives in the talent acquisition space and works with a lot of veterans. Mike? I think the, uh, the best response to that is, I hope so. I hope so. But... <clears throat> They won't value uh, military uh, potential unless we educate them on it. And we're not doing a good job of educating the value that our veterans bring to these companies. The data is there. Again, we just haven't had the right platforms. And, and, and this is a this is a decade long fight to educate business leaders who have no military experience or have never touched the military as to the value of what, what veterans bring. So uh, we're trying to do it. This is one of the emphases uh, of the talent work group. This is why we do what we do, to give them a look at what I consider to be exceptional military leaders, both enlisted and, and officer, and, and hopefully persuade one business leader at a time. But uh, Michael, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I think that the what, what I'd like to add to this discussion is, is this element of the, the, a new look at permeability um, in the uh, in, in a career path in, in the in the army, and and this is where hiring veterans we we typically kind of have a love hate relationship with industry because we, as you alluded to earlier, Mike, we're the premier talent and leadership development you know one of the premier premier organizations in the world, the United States Army, and typically we invest money and and then you know, somebody leaves to go make more money or goes and takes that experience into industry, and we're like ah you know why didn't we keep that 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 gal. Um, and so one of the ways we're looking at this fundamentally differently now is the ability to kind of go between the active component, the guard, the reserve, uh, maybe potentially take what we call a career in a mission program. If you want to go experience something, you want to go study, uh, you want to get a different job. You know, industry uses the term boomerang employee all the time. So why not let somebody go work for Amazon, who's a logistician in the army for a couple of years, and then let's bring them back. Um, and so it, it's a whole new dynamic to the term veteran and employee, because we always think of, you know, we have to grow our talent from the beginning and it has to stay and progress. If we think of it uh, with a more flexible mindset and, and, and allowing people to maneuver uh, in and out uh, of each of the components and potentially even in the civilian industry, I think it changes that dynamic. And then there's a, it's a win-win. It really is. We're, we're sitting here with a perfect example, Lisa. You you got out and then you came back. Um, okay. No, Michael, Michael, that's that's a great answer. And uh, hey, Lisa, I've got to say, I'm. I you know what what's what's really uh, comforting is the military just continues to get better with each day. No matter how old the organization is, it it never accepts the status quo. It's always looking to innovate and adapt. And people ask us, you know. It, Michael, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, sat down with a Vietnam veteran from uh, a SEAL, uh, just said from Vietnam. And at one point he said, you guys are better than us. And I couldn't, I was younger at the time. I couldn't understand it. I'm like, you guys are, we read the books about you guys. You're the reason I, I joined the SEAL teams. And as I left my career, I, I finally understood the next generation is going to be better than us. The next generation of leaders is going to find a way to do things better. And the fact that the Army 
uh, is leading the way on talent management is no surprise to me whatsoever. Congrats on all the work that you've done and thank you for your service to, uh, to this country. Well, Michael, since you are the bell of the ball today, you are definitely on the hot seat. Um, before we move over to Will, so I did not introduce Will in the beginning to uh, those who are listening in, but Will is not just parsley on the plate to make us all look better. He's actually here for a purpose. And that is, he is a young leader within the EF Overwatch organization. And if you've been watching him, he's been taking notes. And once we're all done talking, he's going to go ahead and tell us what from his seat, from his foxhole, what he sees are two or three really good takeaways. Um, there is a competition to make sure that at least one of your points is a good takeaway. <laughs> it's a, a win or fail on this. But uh, before we go to Will, uh, Michael, do you have any last words for the group? Now, what a great opportunity to share some of what what we we're doing. Um, you know, our goal is to is to have more granular information about the talent, the individual differentiated talent that's in the army, and to retain that talent in better ways and 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 um, through a 21st century talent man talent management principles. It's been an honor for me to join our army's leaders on this endeavor. Um, and I'll tell you this, we're, we're only getting started. Um, lots of great things going on, a tremendous amount of work being done to continue to innovate and improve uh, industrial era practices uh, into the 21st century. And what a, what a cool opportunity uh, for me to be a part of it. Um, and so thanks for having me today. And really, as we, as we close out and hear Will's summary, uh, I, I think it's just been an honor to share uh, our work. So thank you. So as we go to the younger generation, and Mike mentioned earlier how the Army keeps getting better, this last weekend I had a couple junior soldiers sucker me into doing a 20K ruck march with them uh, at the last minute. Hey, ma'am, I can't fathom being a junior soldier, even as a lieutenant, and going up to my battalion commander and challenging them to wake up the next morning at 3 o'clock and ruck, but it made me a better officer. It made those soldiers... Um, it demonstrated just the sheer uh, intestinal fortitude that this generation has and how different they are and how willing they are to, to kind of push those barriers. So um, yeah, I am really excited. I hope we can have a couple more of these discussions and I'm throwing you the football, Will. Well, thanks, Lisa. And thank y'all for having me. Um, it's been great being part of this conversation. Uh, so getting into the summary, um, there has been many obvious parallels between Army talent management and uh, the private sector and how we modernize the system of people management, um, especially as we include individuals' preferences. Um, Michael, you mentioned getting on that granular level and becoming more data rich um, and taking, you know, it's not just about performance, it's taking those preferences into account and you, your, your people become more invested. and. Uh, you know, you gain a higher retention for the, for for your organization, and uh, you know, you're right. There's, there's a war for talent, and Lisa, I think you mentioned this, but uh, interviews being um, kind of for both sides of the table. Um, when people have, uh, you know, when they're empowered by their decisions, um, that retention is, is it becomes more obvious. And when you have the right people in the right roles, that not only strengthen the army or strengthen the organization, but strengthen its longevity. And um, Michael, this was interesting that you mentioned it just because, you know, you take preferences into account and uh, you may have to say where your next position or your next role, next unit may be. Um, it's not just a free for all, you know, it's a marketplace for competition still. And um, and but just now that it's more in the light, you know, there's that transparency level. And, I've, and, and I think that's right. that It absolutely forces those discussions and um, forces a, a stronger organization as a whole. Thanks a lot, Will. And as we wrap up, I have um, two uh, plugs here. I've got next week, um, same bat time, same bat channel. It's next week, Thursday. I'll be leading another discussion talking about gaining credibility before asserting authority. And um, again, another topic that's near and dear to my heart is don't come in charging like a bull in a china shop. Uh, rather learn um, the battlefield 
before you initiate the attack. And the next one is, and I have to read this because I was, um, Michelle, who's running IT today, made sure that I don't mess this up since, since I like to go off the cuff a little bit. Um, next week, the Talent War Group is launching the Jedbird podcast. It's hosted by former Special Forces Green Beret, Fran Rachapi. Okay, if you haven't listened to any of his um, LinkedIn Live or podcast yet, you need to because he's very engaging. Um, in each episode, Fran has an in-depth discussion with trailblazers who have earned success through a dedication to talent development, preparation, introspection, and the drive to get things done. I think Fran probably wrote this for himself. The conversation will empower listeners to define success and operate at an elite level. Regardless of the task at hand, find more on the TWG website and stay tuned. Um, to be a little less formal, Fran is absolutely fantastic with regards to um, being engaging and, and getting people to have very good, very critical discussions. So like I said, if you haven't listened to any of his LinkedIn Live podcast sessions yet, go back to our YouTube page and, and listen to some of those. And please come back next week, Thursday. And one last thing is I am looking at those comments. I will hopefully get something out to anyone who follows Talent War Group, either ver via blogs or blogs. Um, and Mr. Arnold, since I have your ear, I'm going to keep your ear. So you may regret reaching out to me. Uh, for everybody listening, thank you so much. Mike, Will, and Michael, thank you so much for spending your Thursday afternoon with me. Thanks, Lisa. It was a pleasure being here. Talent wins and winning matters.